In the automotive world, luxury is an interesting concept because it doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. For some folks out there, it's all about design. Does the car look good enough? For others, it's about the way the car makes you feel on the inside. Is it comfortable enough? Is it well built? For others, it's exclusivity. And for still others, it's reliability and dependability. And that is certainly what Lexus focuses on with their vehicles. Today, I'm taking a look at the very lightly refreshed 2021 Lexus LS Hybrid. This is the ultimate in pragmatic luxury. If you're looking for a full-size luxury sedan in America, I have absolutely no doubt that this Lexus LS Hybrid is going to be the most dependable, the most reliable, the most fuel efficient on gasoline, and likely the least expensive to keep around long-term of any of the full-size luxury sedans that you might have to choose from. Sound off in the comment section and let me know what luxury means to you, and let me know if you think reliability could be a luxury metric in its own right. For 2021, we get some updated LED headlights. These are three module LED headlights with some turning lights right here in the side as well, and a very discreetly tweaked grill. This is the hybrid model, so we have a slightly different grill than we find in the rest of the LS lineup. You can also get an LS with the F Sport package. The LS Hybrid is Lexus's unique twist on a full-size rear-wheel drive luxury sedan. For some reason, the European competition skips right over full hybrid systems like we find in this model, preferring instead to either opt for less expensive mild hybrid systems or more expensive plug-in hybrid systems. And that's one of the reasons that this is going to be quite simply one of the least expensive things to operate on regular gasoline. But Lexus also marches to a different drummer with the formatting of the LS. We no longer have a short wheelbase and a long wheelbase version. Just one happens in the United States, 206.1 inches long, and that is shorter than most of the European competition. This is shorter than the shortest wheelbase version of the Mercedes-Benz S-Class on sale in the US and considerably shorter than the long wheelbase format. One of the downsides to that is rear seat legroom. It is definitely more limited in here than we find in the BMW, the Audi, or the Mercedes. But Lexus marches to a different drummer when it comes to pricing as well. The BMW and the Audi are going to be at least $10,000 more than the Lexus LS starting, and the Mercedes, well, that's at least $35,000 more. In terms of design, the rear end of the LS is a little bit less expressive, a little bit more restrained than the front end design. I have to say this is a very handsome rear end as far as a luxury sedan goes right now. It's not as round or as bulbous as some of the modern Mercedes designs, and I have to say that these particular design elements have grown on me since Lexus first launched them. Since this is a hybrid model, we have no visible exhaust tips down there at the bottom and a subtle amount of chrome. Even though the LS starts less than most of the competition, it is very well equipped in its base format, especially when it comes to active driver assistance tech. We have standard autonomous emergency braking, pedestrian detection, adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, lane keeping assistance, etc. There are still a few features that are available that are not included in the base model, but you'll find them at much lower prices than the competition. In fact, generally speaking, this is going to be considerably lower than any of the competition because by the time you've added practically a steering wheel to a BMW 7 Series, it's going to be about as expensive as the base hybrid model that I'm driving today, which started at $90,500. Now, one vehicle that's definitely a very direct competitor to the Lexus LS and in the same price range, that's the Genesis G90. For the moment at least, there's no such thing as a hybrid G90, but if you still want a naturally aspirated V8 engine, you'll find that in the Genesis. You won't find that anymore in the Lexus. Although the number on the trunk lid is 500, under the hood we have just 3.5 liter V6 engines. Now interesting twist, this platform was designed for the Lexus 5 liter V8. That's one of the reasons we have a long hood and a lot of room between the engine and the front of the vehicle. This is very closely related to the Lexus LC, that's basically the two-door version of the LS, and that does have a 5 liter V8. But under this hood, we have a 3.5 liter twin turbo engine standard, producing 416 horsepower, 442 pound-feet of torque. That engine is mated to a 10-speed automatic transmission, and you'll get 21 or 22 miles per gallon, depending on whether you choose rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Then we get this model right here, which I think is the best version of the LS. It has less power, 354 horsepower, but it's a full hybrid. It's based on a 3.5-liter, naturally aspirated V6. Lexus doesn't give us any official torque numbers. I suspect it's somewhere around 390 pound-feet of torque. Outside the United States, Lexus has offered rear-wheel drive hybrids before, but what makes this system a little bit different is that in addition to the planetary power split device inside the hybrid system transmission, it also has a four-speed stepped automatic. So this transmission will imitate 10 gears total, four of them are going to be real, six of them are going to be using the power split device and the four-speed automatic transmission to give you some sort of ratio between the engine and the wheels. This engine and transmission option bump fuel economy all the way up to 28 miles per gallon if you choose the rear-wheel drive model. And interestingly, 0-60 performance is not really as affected as you might think. We'll talk about that in the drive section. 
Recently, a lot of folks have asked me how expensive is it to replace a hybrid battery pack? Well, I called my local Lexus dealer. Inclusive of labor, it would be about $6,000 on this model if the battery were to fail after warranty. That is considerably less expensive than replacing the battery on a European hybrid or a European plug-in hybrid. Rather unfortunately, Kristen Barkley, who does our social media over at facebook.com slash alexonautos, she actually has an S400 hybrid and her dealer quoted her $30,000 for the battery replacement. Battery is actually a little bit smaller than the one in this one. It's a bit of a digression, but if anybody is interested in that saga and how it ends up going, be sure and follow us over at facebook.com slash alexandautos. I reached out to a number of other Mercedes dealers and I got quotes ranging from a low of $16,000 on up to a high of nearly $40,000. So either way, very expensive repair, considerably less expensive if you're worried about that long term in something like this. When it comes to engineering, Lexus has long been a very conservative company. And that's one of the reasons that up until now, we haven't found million way adjustable seats like we find in a lot of European luxury vehicles. But with the Lexus LS, they've thrown caution to the wind. And this is by far the most adjustable seat that Lexus has ever made. And I think the most comfortable as well. Not only do we have four way adjustable lumbar support, not only does the front passenger seat have the same range of motion as the driver's seat, but the seat also moves in ways that not all the competition does. For instance, I can press this little button here and I can make the seat bottom cushion inflate and deflate to make the center of the seat a little bit higher sort of like sitting on a medicine ball or a little bit lower so you sort of sink into the seat a little bit more you can also adjust the curvature of the seat back headrest moves in four ways inflatable side bolsters extending thigh cushion and front seat massage for the driver front passenger electric tilt telescopic steering column and three position memory on the door one downside to selecting the LS over the European competition is going to be interior room. We just don't find as much of it in here as you'll find in an S-Class short wheelbase or a 7 Series or an A8. You'll notice that if I sit right behind myself, front seat's just for me at 6 feet tall, I still have a generous amount of room, about 6 or 7 inches left, but not as much room as you'd find in the competition. The Audi, the BMW, and the Mercedes all offer at least 4 to 5 inches more combined legroom, and a bit more headroom as well. If I put my head back here to the headrest, my hair is just barely brushing the ceiling, it's pretty comfortable but you will find a skosh more room in some of those other options. If I lift up this center armrest and move over to the right side, you'll really notice the difference. This front seat's almost all the way back in its tracks. I had a six foot five person there. I have about two and a half inches of leg room left. Now, these rear seats in this particular model are powered. If you get this option, then the rear seats are controlled via this touchscreen right here in the center console. We also have some cup holders there up front and a storage area there behind. This is not a removable tablet style screen. It's fixed in the vehicle. You can control things like the window shades with these buttons or the power rear seats. Let's go ahead and control the right seat there. You can see lots of adjustable motion here. You can move the head restraint in four ways. You can adjust the curvature of the seat back. They call that the seat bolster. You can recline that forward and backward. There's a four-way lumbar adjustment and this particular option here, this pelvic option is kind of an odd one. It adjusts the very lower portion of the seat right there so that way it doesn't feel like you're sitting in a bowl. You can also adjust the seat bottom cushion up and down. And logically, in order to get the most comfort out of that, we can also adjust the front passenger seat and make sure that is moved out of the way so that way the rear passenger can get all the legroom they want. These are some of the most comfortable luxury sedan rear seats available, but keep in mind that because we have less legroom than some of those European options, it's not gonna be quite as comfortable for taller folks. The bulk of the interior design has not changed for 2021, but Lexus has tweaked things around the edges, giving us more premium materials, softer touches for the armrests, things like that. We still have the optional Mark Levinson audio system available, with lots of speakers all the way around the interior, including some rear speakers right back there in the ceiling, right by those vanity mirrors for the rear passengers. We have a pretty typically sized sunroof right there, just over the driver and front passenger's heads. No panoramic moonroof there. Hydro adjustable shoulder belts, four-way adjustable headrests. Again, those million-way adjustable seats. The ambient lighting is a bit more subtle in here than it is in modern Mercedes models. You can see that ambient light strip right there just behind that wood section on the door. There are a bunch of different interior options, including some ruffled door panels. It's kind of an interesting look. Also some glass options if you don't want wood on the interior. Lexus has a bunch of different things that you can select. Moving over to the dashboard, we have this very distinctive design. Let me know what you think about it with these lines that run right across from one side to the other. The big change in the dashboard, of course, is this infotainment system, which is now a large touchscreen system, and that makes it much easier to use. Now, the one twist with this touchscreen infotainment system is that we still have the touchpad controller down here, and you're still going to need to use it for some things, mainly the menu button and this little contextual pop-up button right there. If you want to go to this menu where you can actually select between CarPlay and the other items, you'll actually have to use that menu button. If, for instance, you're in the factory mapping interface, you're still going to need to press the menu button if you want to change, say, to Apple CarPlay. 
If I'm in Apple CarPlay, I can exit by hitting that Lexus button, but it's going to take me back to the last thing that was used. Generally, it's going to be the map there. And you're going to need to press that menu button if you want to, for instance, get to the setup option, the climate options, etc. Below that, we have the engine start stop button, two large air vents. Nice touch here is that the air vents have a very nice look to them so that way these lines aren't disturbed when the vent is being moved around. Controls for the front two climate control zones. This has a four zone climate control system, auto brake hold right there, CD player, two large cup holders behind that little panel. We have a joystick style shifter, park is that button right there. Trackpad for the infotainment system, a button to raise and lower the air suspension in the vehicle. Air suspension is now standard for 2021. Rear sunshade button right there. These two buttons are shortcut buttons, so if I press the one on the left, it brings up the seat settings and also the heated steering wheel, so it's a little bit easier to interact with. And if I press the seat button, that brings up the seat adjustment options. Also, driver seat refresh, which is what they call their massage feature. The padded center armrest opens from either side. We press the button on the driver's side or on the passenger side to be given this large storage area right here with two USB inputs, auxiliary input, and a 12-volt power port. Even back when this generation LS launched, I thought that the instrument cluster was a little bit small. Let me know what you think about that. This is a seven inch LCD on the driver's side, and then we have analog gauges for the engine temperature and fuel level. It's placed in this binnacle, which is quite large, and so it makes the display feel just a little smaller than I think it otherwise would have if they'd put a different sort of treatment there. And it definitely feels small compared to this large LCD infotainment system. Now, admittedly, if I had to choose, I would much rather have a small LCD cluster and a big LCD infotainment system, but I would also really love to see what Lexus could do with, say, a 12-inch screen if the Lexus LS gets a refresh. Now, some of the newer Lexus models will have big LCDs, so hopefully that's something that the LS gets at some point later. We have a part wood, part leather steering wheel. You can see leather on the outside, leather really on the inside as well. So sort of a quarter wood section right there on the top and on the bottom in those two pieces. It really has a nice design without affecting the grip level that you'd get in a full wood steering wheel. The paddle shifters on the back, down on the left, up on the right. Controls that multifunction LCD cluster over here on the left side. They split the infotainment buttons. So volume up down over here, track up down over here on the right side, and then controls for the standard Raider adaptive cruise control system over there. The small LCD is a little bit less important in this model because this one does have Lexus's large full color heads up display. While we're up here, we also have some knobs for the drive systems here. This engages snow mode or turns off traction control. And then the one on this side changes the drive mode. Out on the road, you won't notice too much difference between the LS500 from 2022 and the LS500 from 2021. But if you choose the 500H, then we get a slightly tweaked hybrid system that does improve performance. Lexus has tightened up the shifts and the imitation shifts of the transmission, and they've tweaked the way the hybrid system behaves. Remember, this actually does have a stepped four-speed automatic transmission, but when it's imitating gears, for instance, here with the paddle shifters, not all of the gear shifts are going to be quote-unquote real. Zero to 60 time improves, and this is now zero to 60 in five seconds even. Now this LS Hybrid is a rear wheel drive trim. If you choose the all wheel drive option, I suspect zero to 60 times might be a little bit slower because this didn't really have any traction problems. While I'm talking about traction, one thing that you should know is that all LS models except for the F Sport get 245 with tires all the way around. The F Sport trim gets wider tires in the rear, and that does affect handling. This is not going to grip the road as well as the Audi, the BMW, or the Mercedes if you choose the right options in those vehicles. This Lexus weighs about the same as most of the European competition, and the suspension is very well tuned in terms of its precision and its feel, but the grip is just not going to be at the same level as the A8 or the 7 Series or the S-Class. Tires logically also have an impact on the 60 to 0 stopping distance. It took this model 125 feet to stop from 60, and you will definitely find shorter stopping distances in the BMW, the Mercedes, and the Audi. But when it comes to ride quality, it's honestly pretty similar. I love the way that the LS is tuned. Again, this has a really precise steering feel, good suspension tune, doesn't become upset over really anything that you can throw at it, and it doesn't have that same sort of bobble heady feel that you can sometimes get in other air suspension designs. For instance, this week I have a Mercedes-Benz EQS, and that definitely feels a little too floaty, whereas this vehicle feels sorted but comfortable. Therefore, when it comes to handling, I'm going to give this a B because of the reduced grip, but when it comes to ride, I'm certainly going to give this an A. According to Lexus, the engineers went through the suspension system and tweaked just about everything, hardware and software alike. This air suspension has adaptive damping capability and adaptive height capability. I can command a slightly higher ride height by pressing this high button, so if you're living down a gravel road like the one that I'm on here, you don't have to worry so much. But it's not like the LS is super close to the ground anyway, so honestly, it's just fine here. In addition to the right height being adjustable, the damping is adjustable. You control that via the knob just above the instrument cluster. You can adjust it between comfort, normal, sport, and sport plus. But any way you have the suspension set, it's still going to be on the softer side of things. And that's just how LS shoppers like it. 
When it comes to cabin noise, I'm going to give this a B because there are definitely luxury options that are quieter than this. In this particular cabin, I measured 71 and a half decibels. There are BMWs and Mercedes out there that will drop that down to 69. I have to say that the cabin noise surprised me a little bit and I blame the factory tires on this particular model. Out on a rougher road surface, you'll definitely notice more road noise, but on a quieter road surface, this is going to be just about as hushed as the competition. So if you're really worried about a quiet ride and you want a Lexus LS, you might want to swap out the factory tires. Of course, when it comes to fuel economy, this hands down has to get an A. This is the most efficient thing that you don't have to plug in. Over a week of mixed driving, I've been averaging 30.5 MPG. That is definitely above the EPA estimate for this vehicle. And as we see in other Lexus hybrids, even if you're driving this aggressively, fuel economy will not drop as low as some of the European plug-in hybrids. It's also worth noting that if you're taking a look at anything in the luxury segment that is a plug-in hybrid, there aren't too many options in this same size segment, but something like a Volvo S90, I guess, could be a competitor to this, they're going to feel quite different because they're going to be a lot heavier. Bigger batteries mean more curb weight, and this has a relatively small and relatively lightweight battery. So this feels an awful lot like the regular LS, it just happens to be a hybrid. And of course, there are other dynamic considerations with the S90. That hybrid system gives you over 400 horsepower and fuel economy that's substantially similar to this, but the feel is going to be quite different. It's going to give you 300 horsepower on the front axle, not a lot of power on the back. Now, it's getting a bit of a tweak for 2022 and a half. It's going to get more power in the rear, even faster 0 to 60 scores, but it's still dynamically not going to feel like a rear wheel drive vehicle. There's just too much weight and too much power going on up front. Now, it is definitely going to be swift. It is going to be faster than this. It's just not going to be as much fun if you do want to drive your big luxury sedan a little bit harder. If you put this in Sport Plus, things definitely firm up to the point where you could have a lot of fun out on your favorite winding mountain road. And in that respect, this is definitely more similar to the BMW and the Mercedes. All of the options in this segment are definitely tuned towards the softer side of things because that's what people that are shopping for big sedans seem to want. Bottom line, this is one of the very few no compromises hybrids in America. With the additional tweaks that Lexus has made for 2021, this is only a hair slower than the regular twin turbo model while giving you significantly better fuel economy. In the real world, this is going to be 50 to 60% better fuel economy than you'll find in that twin turbo model. And that's mainly talking about highway fuel economy. If you do a lot of in-city driving, stop and go driving, this is going to be double the fuel economy that you'll get in that turbo model. With the refinements to the hybrid system, Lexus has definitely made it more engaging to drive, but you will still get some somewhat unusual V6 noises in the cabin now and then. Historically, the LS has been the flagship Lexus in America, but today it's really just the flagship sedan. The Lexus LC has a higher starting price, and the brand new Lexus LX is likely going to be the most expensive Lexus, although no pricing details are available for that just yet. In terms of starting price, for 2022, the LS500 starts at $76,000 for rear-wheel drive, $79,250 for all-wheel drive, because a few other features come along with the all-wheel drive system. And again, although I don't have detailed pricing information, expect the hybrid model to go well over $100,000. The rear-wheel drive LS500 non-hybrid goes up to around $108,000 with all the option boxes checked. However, that is still significantly less than most of the competition. Let's roll through some of those competitors right now, and you'll see what I mean about the LS500 being unusually positioned in this full-size luxury segment. The Audi A8 starts at $86,500. That's with the 3-liter turbocharged V6 engine. There is a plug-in hybrid drivetrain available, and there's also a V8 drivetrain available as well. Any way you slice it, the Audi A8 is going to be more expensive than the Lexus. It starts about $10,000 more expensive. Comparably equipped, it's going to be at least $10,000 more to $15,000 more, depending on the options that you select. With most of the European rivals, there are a few more options available in the Audi that we don't find available in the Lexus. But Lexus has really closed the gap with this generation of the LS, especially when it comes to the seats up front. They're comfortable, they provide that massage functionality, and they have the adjustability that you'd expect in a flagship luxury sedan. But the Audi A8 has a few tech gadgets that just feel a little bit more modern, mostly the LCD infotainment system and the LCD instrument cluster. Both of those feel about a light year ahead of what we see in the Lexus. One odd thing, as I noted before, is that the LS has a fairly small instrument cluster. I thought that was small even when this generation of LS launched. And the infotainment system, even though it's a really big LCD, the software really isn't that good. 
Hopefully that's going to be rectified with the next generation LS because the next generation of Lexus infotainment system is as good as this current generation system honestly is below par. Lexus has been reinserting a touchscreen in several models, even with the older software, but the way the software is designed, you still sometimes have to use the Lexus touchpad or the Lexus mouse pad, whatever you want to call it for some system functions that does make it a little bit clunky. Next up, we have the BMW 7 series. This starts at $86,800, a little bit more expensive than the Audi. And like the Audi, it's going to be considerably more expensive when you start adding options onto it. It's going to be at least 10 grand more that scales up to about $20,000 more. And if you want to get carried away with things, you can get an Alpina version of the uh, BMW 7 Series, and that will definitely be very expensive. You can also, of course, get their twin turbo V12. That is an absolutely mind-blowingly excellent engine, but it's going to cost you significantly more than the Lexus. What kind of comes to mind whenever I think of the BMW 7 Series is this is sort of the German Buick, if you will. It is definitely not as sporty as some folks might think. If you've never driven a 7 Series and you have the opportunity, I suggest you do it because it is tuned considerably softer than any other BMW sold in North America. Even the 740, even the Alpina versions of the 7 Series, they're definitely tuned towards the softer side of things. BMW's interior design in the 7 Series is a little bit more minimalist than the Audi A8, in my opinion, definitely versus the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Now, there's nothing particularly wrong with being sort of the German Buick in this segment. I actually love the 7 Series, and if I were buying a German option in this segment, I would probably get the 7 Series over the Mercedes because it's a lot less expensive, and I would get it over the Audi A8 because I like the weight balance and I like the feature set in the BMW a little bit more. I also really, really love that V12, obviously, if money was absolutely no question. Moving on, the real direct competitor to the LS, in my opinion, is the Genesis G90, because it's most like the Lexus. It is more similar in terms of size, and it's more similar in terms of its starting and lower end price tags. Although some folks out there are going to be buying a $110,000, $120,000 Lexus LS, most folks are going to be buying a Lexus LS that's somewhere in the $85,000 to perhaps $90,000 price range, and that's a lot more similar to what we see in the Genesis product line. The G90 currently starts at $73,950, that's with the 3.3 liter twin turbo 6, but for 2023, the G90 is getting a complete redesign, and its price tag is likely going to be a bit more expensive even than the Lexus LS. With a lot of the recent Genesis product line, it's clear that they're targeting the Europeans a little bit more than the Japanese, so I would expect the price tag to be perhaps a little bit closer. Also of interest, the new G90 is going to have a stretched wheelbase option. It's going to be about 8 inches longer in its longest format than the G90 we're currently getting, and it's going to be significantly bigger than the Lexus LS. Now at this point in time, we don't know whether we're going to get the short one or the long one. We don't know anything about engines under the hood just yet, and we haven't even seen an interior picture of the new G90. All of that is going to be coming soon, and by the time you watch this video, some of that may be available, so be sure and check out the Genesis site for that. At the moment, however, the G90 is a good deal. If you're looking at the LS and you want to perhaps spend a little bit less, and you want a naturally aspirated V8, or you're interested in just spending less for a twin turbo 6, the G90 might be a good option for you. The interior has had a relatively recent refresh and it's pretty current for the Genesis lineup, but if you want the latest, you're gonna to wanna to wait till 2023. That's also likely when we're going to see a full electric version of the G90. Rather than giving us plug-in hybrids or higher output gasoline drivetrains, Genesis has decided to simply move over to electrification. So there's going to be an electric GV70, an electric G80, an electric G90 in the lineup as well. That means that if you're interested in a naturally aspirated V8, you're going to want the current generation G90. And the G90 honestly reminds me a lot of the previous generation Lexus LS. It drives very much like the previous generation LS. I think the current one has a little bit sharper handling. It's a little bit more interesting in terms of its driving dynamics out on the road. The G90 is very good, but it's not quite the level of polish where we see the current generation LS. I think it competes very well with the outgoing model. Of course, what has historically separated the LS from the competition, and will likely continue to do so, is legendary Lexus LS reliability. Lexus has long been known as the most reliable or one of the most reliable brands, depending on the year and the metric that you're looking at, and the LS is usually the pinnacle of Lexus reliability. I don't expect that to change too much for this generation. This generation Lexus LS does appear to be a little bit behind the previous generation in terms of reliability. It is a bit more complicated, a lot more gadgets going on, the new twin turbo engine, etc. But if I were to bet, this is going to be the most reliable twin turbo V6 available. My bottom line recommendation is split. 
If you're looking to buy your next luxury sedan, you should buy the LS. It's definitely going to be the least expensive of this bunch to keep around long term. Repairs and maintenance are generally less expensive in the Lexus versus the Audi or the Mercedes or the BMW. And long term repair and dependability costs are also likely going to be considerably less expensive, especially if you're comparing the LS500 to something like a Mercedes Benz S Class. It's going to be a lot less expensive to buy, a lot less expensive to insure and keep around. If, on the other hand, you're looking to lease your next full size luxury sedan, then I would probably buy one of the German options. I would probably end up with something like the BMW 7 Series because I do like the feature set. I like the extra power that we get in that model. And honestly, reliability within the three year window, it's not going to be too much of a problem. You're going to be inside the warranty, you're going to be inside the lease. And after three years, it's absolutely someone else's problem. And that's the big reason that the vast majority of full size luxury sedans here in the US are leased because the owner doesn't want to worry about that after the three year term. Before I end this episode, I should caution you that battery pack replacement in a Lexus hybrid is extraordinarily rare, especially when we're talking under 100,000 miles, it's practically unheard of. Under 200,000 miles, it's still pretty rare. It's not until you get to three, 400,000 miles, the battery pack replacements in Lexus hybrids becomes a bit more common. And the LS is really going to be no different than the RX hybrid or the ES hybrid in the way that it's using the battery pack. Be sure and let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And what would you get if you were shopping in this segment? Would you get something like the LS or would you be more interested in some of the gadgets that we find in the Europeans? Be sure and find me over at facebook.com slash Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you later.